Hey everyone, former film student back with another video. So after some clamoring from diehard fans, just kidding, it was just a few of my friends asking me, I've decided to make my top 10 movies of the year list. Now for 2022, I ended up doing a video just ranking every movie that I had seen, but I saw way more movies this year. And for the sole purpose of this video not being 40 minutes long, I've decided to just talk about my top favorite movies of 2021. Yes, I know this is a little late, but also there were some movies that had the potential to slip into my top 10, and even then I haven't gotten a chance to see everything that I wanted to. But hey, better late than never. Last thing, this is my list. So no, I'm not saying these are the top 10 best movies of the year, but they are my favorite, and when making this list, I try to have a balance of my personal enjoyment as well as just genuine quality. So with that being said, let's get started. But before starting off on my actual top 10 list, I want to throw a few movies out there that are honorable mentions. Movies that I really enjoyed but didn't quite crack the top 10. Saint Maud was a pretty fantastic and unique horror film. I feel that religion and horror hasn't been explored to its fullest potential. But I had a lot of fun with Saint Maud as well as it genuinely having some really intense and terrifying moments. The next honorable mention is The French Dispatch, the latest Wes Anderson flick. I saw this in theaters and had a lot of fun with it. While I've never been the biggest Wes Anderson fan, there's no denying his talent and ability to interweave a multitude of stories and characters together and do so in an extremely entertaining and cohesive way. I don't think it's as good as Grand Budapest Hotel or Fantastic Mr. Fox, but still a really well done movie. The Power of the Dog is another film that I really enjoyed, and this will most likely rake in a ton of Oscar nominations. Benedict Cumberbatch is possibly the best we've ever seen him, and Kristen Dunst turns in a great performance as well. The cinematography was also pretty great, and I really enjoyed the musical composition. Next is Malignant. Man, Malignant is a movie that had the dumbest trailers I've seen in a while, yet absolutely stunned me when I saw it. I don't remember having this much fun with a horror film since maybe Cabin in the Woods. And if you're someone who has found horror to be a bit repetitive and stale lately, give Malignant a watch. This movie is batshit crazy and some of the most fun I've had at a theater all year. The last honorable mention is Judas and the Black Messiah. Not much to say about this film that hasn't already been said, it's extremely well shot, well edited, and brilliantly acted, and it deserved all of the Oscar attention and praise it received at last year's Academy Awards. So now with the honorable mentions out of the way, let's get into the actual top 10. Coming in at number 10 is Lamb, an international co-produced film from Iceland, Sweden, and Poland directed by Valdemir Johansson. This film hooked me from the first trailer and had me invested throughout the entire film. The cinematography is absolutely gorgeous, utilizing its Icelandic location to its fullest potential. What can I say? This movie is weird as shit. It's equal parts horror and family drama, but unlike anything you've ever seen. I was constantly perplexed throughout the entire film, never really knowing where the story was headed. And for someone who's seen as many films as I have, that's a very rare occurrence. The climax is one of my favorites of the year, and despite the thrilling nature of the story and slow burn horror elements, what I connected with the most was the family aspect. The film evokes certain emotions that are hard to come by, and Lamb ultimately is a story about family. It's unique, creative, visually fantastic, and has a great score. I have not seen this director's other work, but he has my attention. And bonus points for Naomi Rapace turning in a fantastic but subtle performance. Coming in at number 9 is Bo Burnham's Inside. I've been a Bo Burnham fan since I stumbled upon his country song bit on YouTube a few years back. I really enjoyed his directorial debut 8th grade, but found it a bit tame, visually boring, and not as thought-provoking and clever as his stand-up. All of that was vastly, and I mean vastly, improved with Inside. It's hard to explain the emotions I felt while watching this, a messy blend of sadness, empathy, sympathy, and laughter. The amount of emotion Burnham was able to put into an 87-minute long film taking place in one room is nothing short of brilliant. The visuals are gorgeous and distinct, the songs are extremely witty, hilarious, and powerful, and the fact that he was able to make this film feel so engaging, so personal, yet so imaginative with so little resources is proof that Bo Burnham is one of the most talented people of our time. Seriously, if you haven't seen this film, go give it a watch. It's really something special. In eighth place, we have a movie that I wasn't exactly excited for, but ended up absolutely loving, and that was Spencer. I know I may get a lot of hate for this, but I really knew nothing about Princess Diana prior to this other than watching a short interview of her a few years before her death. The royal family and their antics just never interested me, however, between the incredibly strong direction from Pablo Lorraine and the Oscar-worthy performance from Kristen Stewart, I was locked in from the opening shot. The visuals are gorgeous, and the decision to shoot on both 16mm and 35mm film was superb, as it really helps put you into the time period. On top of the brilliant visuals, the use of editing and music to 
evoke certain emotions was pretty masterful. There's a layer of dread and dreariness that coats the film, and the dirtiness and grittiness of the film grain gives the images such depth and texture. As mentioned, Kristen Stewart is brilliant, and the film is quite heartbreaking at times. As you watch a woman struggling with her own mental health and personal issues on top of being trapped in this horrific family. The royal family, whether or not they played a part in her death or not, should be ashamed for how they treated her. Diana deserved better, and this film highlights that without restriction. A very well-made and emotional film from start to finish. Coming in at number 7, and a bit ironic, as in my previous video I said superhero films aren't bound to end up on my best of the year list. But Spider-Man No Way Home is the exception. I'm no stranger to the concept that I view films differently than an average moviegoer. I don't just stop at wanting to be entertained. Sometimes it makes watching films less fun, but other times it leads me to films that change my world view or how I perceive things. Neither are right or wrong, and it all depends on what each individual wants from a given film. And not to get too personal here, but life can be tough, especially once you grow up and you feel like all the magic that was once in the world has been eradicated by adulthood and the struggles that come along with it. Not to mention being in a worldwide pandemic that's now lasted two years. Yet every so often something comes along, a movie, a show, a meal, a board game. Hell, maybe it's even a scent that makes you feel like a kid again and all of that life and sense of wonder and joy floods back into you. That happened to me with Spider-Man No Way Home. It's a rare thing to feel like that, but I'll never forget how I felt sitting in the theater when Tobey Maguire walked through that portal and I suddenly turned into a six-year-old again watching my DVD copy of Spider-Man. For that alone, it deserves this spot. Coming in at number six is Licorice Pizza. Okay, let's get this out of the way. There are two controversial elements of this film that I'll quickly address. First, there's a very dated and useless joke about an Asian stereotype that honestly didn't bother me all that much. My biggest issue with the joke is that it didn't serve any purpose and wasn't all that funny. Don't even take it just from me. There was one guy in my packed theater who laughed at the joke. It's a dumb joke. There was no point in having it in the film. The second controversy is one I understand a lot more as to why it could put someone off to this film, that being the age difference between Cooper Hoffman and Alana Haim's characters. Alana Haim's supposed to be 25 in the film, while Hoffman is 15. While it is a bit off-putting, I think the thing that keeps it from being too big of an issue for me personally is the time the film is set in, which is the 1970s, as well as the romance aspect never feeling sexual charged in the way that a film like Call Me By Your Name is. Controversy aside, this film is excellent from pretty much every conceivable film metric. The music, the beautiful and purposeful cinematography, the performances, especially from Haim and Hoffman, the direction, the pacing, all of it was superb. Paul Thomas Anderson at this point in his career has filmmaking down to a science, so the quality of his films boils down to whether or not the screenplay works. And for me, it absolutely works in this one. I constantly had a smile on my face throughout the entire film. It's such a fun, joyful, and an optimistic film about young love, rushing to grow up, and balancing who you think you should be and who you are. I loved everything about this story, and I can't wait to watch it again. Oh boy, we have cracked the top five, starting with a film that I can't wait to revisit, The Green Knight. There has been such a glaring lack of quality fantasy films since Lord of the Rings ended back in the early 2000s. Sure, we had Game of Thrones to hold us off for a while, but... We all know how that ended. Thankfully, we now have The Green Knight. I had a fucking blast with this movie, right from the opening shot with a levitating Dev Patel catching on fire as an ominous voiceover sets the stage for the rest of the film. The blend of lo-fi and hi-fi fantasy was absolutely stellar. Dev Patel gives a fantastic performance as Sir Gawain, and his journey to reach the Green Knight I found to be absolutely riveting. The film is gorgeously shot, not only from a camera work perspective, but also the lighting, the costume and set design were marvelous as well, and the VFX for the most part, except for the Fox, were pretty stellar. I never once found myself bored throughout the entire film, and it also has one of my favorite third acts and endings of the entire year. The music was also amazing, and I can't wait to hopefully buy the soundtrack on vinyl and give it another listen through. Take notes, Hollywood. Give the people more fantasy films like this. At four, we have a film that I had no idea would be this high on my list before watching. That film is Pig. I blame the marketing and reception of this film for my lack of excitement. It was always billed as John Wick with a pig and Nick Cage, which sounded kind of cool, but what we got was so much more than I could have hoped for. I saw a YouTube comment on a review for this film that said the film starts off as a simple revenge story and then a wave of compassion and vulnerability washes over it. And there's no better way to describe this movie. This is not an action-packed revenge story, it's a drama about loss and recovery, about appreciating life and taking every opportunity to do what makes us happy when that opportunity arises. Similar to Inside, it's hard for me to describe the feelings and emotions this film evoked in me on a core and fundamental level. Earlier when I was discussing films that can change your perception of the world or the way you think, well this is one of those films. 
It's a slow burn drama, but it's packed with so much emotion and heart that I couldn't help but be awe-inspired and moved by it. If you have Hulu, do yourself a favor and watch this beautiful film. We've arrived at the top three, and this is why I waited this long to make this video, because coming in at number three is The Tragedy of Macbeth, directed by Joel Cohen. I had no idea I would be this invested, this enthralled by a story in which I knew how everything would play out. A Shakespeare story that has been told and retold dozens of times across a multitude of different medias, but none with this level of craftsmanship and quality filmmaking. What else would we expect from a film helmed by the guy who directed No Country for Old Men and Inside Lewin Davis, starring two of the most prominent actors of the last few decades in Denzel Washington and Frances McDormand fresh off her Oscar win. Until seeing this movie, I thought there was no way any film this year could have stronger cinematography than Dune, which I felt on a visual and audio level was a pure masterpiece. Well, sorry Dune, because Tragedy of Macbeth is some of the best cinematography I've seen not only this year, but maybe ever. Gorgeous black and white imagery boxed in by a fitting 4x3 aspect ratio that feels as if it's trapping the characters within the image, almost squeezing them as Macbeth starts to lose his sanity slowly but surely. A host of fantastic performances from the entire cast and just sheer phenomenal filmmaking. I was worried how Joel Cohen would fare with this being the first film he's directed without his longtime directorial partner and brother Ethan Cohen, but my fears were subsided almost immediately with the breathtaking opening shot. From there, I found myself completely engrossed by the world that was placed before me. I almost feel it was a disservice and disrespectful of me to have not seen this in the largest theater screen possible. If this film is showing near you in a theater, do yourself a favor and watch it. The visuals alone are enough for me to want to revisit this as soon as possible. Deciding between my number one and number two is always difficult. This year was no exception. On any given day, either of these films could take the number one spot. But on this day, coming in at number two is Dune. I'm a firm believer that Dune director Denis Villeneuve is the best filmmaker of the 2010s and will one day go down as one of the best filmmakers of all time. His 2010s filmography is unbelievable. In Sundays, Prisoners, Enemy, Sicario, Arrival, Blade Runner 2049, and now Dune. Now as I mentioned when discussing Macbeth, Dune in my opinion is a visual and audio masterpiece. I think story and character are unquestionably crucial in a film, and despite me not connecting that well with any of the characters yet, the sheer scope and scale of this film is unmatched in cinematic history. The blend of visuals and audio is unlike anything I've ever seen or heard. Anyone who saw this in IMAX knows exactly what I'm talking about. I sat in a theater with my jaw dropped in complete awe and wonder. It made me think of the early days of cinema, the days of the Lumiere brothers and George Miley and wonder, when they were making these simplistic films in the early days of film creation, I wonder if they ever could have imagined something this grand, this epic, this visually stunning. This film is a work of art. I will fully admit that the characterizations and the story weren't as engaging as some of the other films previously on this list. However, film was created as a visual medium, and then became visual and auditory in 1927 with the introduction of sound and film. I have to imagine, though, that when the concept of film and movies became a reality, that something like Dune is what they had hoped would be the peak of the format, the perfect synchronization between image and sound. I loved Dune, and it's another theater experience that I'll soon not forget. Well, we've arrived at my number one spot for 2021, the film that I consider to be not only my favorite film of the year, but what I consider to be the best film of 2021 as well. That honor goes to the Palme d'Or winning French film Tatane, directed by Julia de Corneau. I really wish I could describe or talk about the plot of this film, but it's so spoiler heavy. But much like Lamb, this film went in directions and had me perplexed as to where the story would go on a near constant basis. I'm guaranteeing that no matter how many films that you think you've seen, you've never seen a film like this. This film floored me from start to finish. So much so that after walking out of the theater with my friend, neither of us said a word for about five minutes. I was simply stunned by it. I went into it without having seen a single trailer or knowing anything about the plot, and at the time, hadn't seen the director's previous film, Raw. As a writer and filmmaker myself, it's not uncommon to find myself in a creative rut. There will be weeks at a time where I find myself uninspired. Anyone who's a creative will know exactly what I'm talking about. However, every so often, a movie or show will come out that will inject you with creative juices and have it coursing through your veins in a matter of minutes. Tatane is that type of film. It felt like an EMT had jump-started my heart. 
I don't think this film has a single flaw. It's beautifully shot with distinct and memorable visuals. I can literally picture several scenes in my head just because the imagery was so unforgettable. The performances were immaculate, with Agatha Roussel turning in my favorite performance in a film since Robert Pattinson in The Lighthouse. The screenplay is unique and brilliant and somehow manages to be one of the most horrifying and brutal films I've ever seen while simultaneously being one of the most compassionate and tender. In this day and age, with the constant reboots, sequels, remakes, and adaptations, this film feels about as refreshing as a nice ice-cold lemonade in the Sahara Desert. I loved everything about this film, and I don't think there's a single thing I would change. Julia DeCorno is one of the most promising up-and-coming directors working today, and it's an absolute fucking embarrassment that this film didn't make the shortlist for Best Foreign Language Film. What a fucking disgrace. Anyway, while Dune may be a visual and audio masterpiece in my eyes, Tatane is a film that I haven't gone a week without thinking about since I saw it way back in October. Truly brilliant filmmaking and storytelling, and I cannot wait to see what this genius director does next. Well, that is it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your favorite movies of the year. I always have fun making these lists, so I hope you had as much fun watching this as I did making it. That being said, if you liked this video, make sure to click the like button, subscribe if you want to hear more from me, and click the little bell notification so you do get notified when I post new videos. And as always, I will see you guys on the next video.